As a society, we're often fascinated by last words. What are the last words uttered before a person passes from this world into the next? Now, right now, some of you are thinking, a cheery subject, Josh. I'm glad I tuned in. I, this is Easter, right? I mean, isn't it supposed to be a celebration? And you're doing a last words thing here? All right, stay with me. It's gonna get hopeful and encouraging. But sometimes, to get to celebration world, you've gotta pass through reflection land first. If you Google last words, you'll find over 41 million results. Articles and even whole websites that are dedicated to discussing people's last words. For better or for worse, for right or wrong, we often place a special significance on what people had to say in the final moments of their lives. Now, sometimes the words are poignant. Sometimes they're sweet. Sometimes they're funny. When a priest told Charlie Chaplin, may the Lord have mercy on your soul as he was on his deathbed, Charlie Chaplin said, why not? After all, it belongs to him. And sometimes final words are mysterious. Walt Disney's purported final words was a name. The name of a young actor who had appeared in some of his films, Kurt Russell. Now, nobody knew why or what Disney meant to express, and even the famous Snake Plissken actor isn't sure what Disney was about. But either way, Kurt Russell was Disney's last words. It's Easter, and it's time to remember and reflect on what Jesus did for us. It's time to celebrate what Jesus did for us. Yeah, actually, we should do that every single day, and especially every single Sunday until Jesus comes back. But this is the day that we've marked on the calendar to put special significance on the most important action taken in the history of mankind and the most generous gift presented to us. Now, in Scripture, we find seven statements that Jesus made as he was on the cross, sometimes referred to as seven sayings of the cross. Whose final words could have more significance than those of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, our Savior? So here they are. Here are the seven statements of the cross, Jesus' final words before his death. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Truly, I say to you, you'll be with me today in paradise. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. And finally, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now these are all profound and powerful statements. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. As a statement about forgiveness, even for heinous acts. Also a statement about the people not recognizing the Christ for who he truly was. Uh, truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. A statement about eternal life being available to people no matter their background, simply for putting their trust in Jesus. Followed by a statement that not only do things of the next world matter, but also things of this world. When Jesus puts John in charge of taking care of Mary, entrusting her welfare to him with woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And then a reminder that Jesus was not only fully God, but also fully human. And a painful and questioning statement, perhaps in the very moment that Jesus was taking the sins of the world upon himself, all of them, past, present, and future, 
when Jesus asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The next statement would be a reminder that Jesus was indeed human with human needs as well as being fully God. But it was also a simple fulfillment of prophecy in the Messianic Psalm 69. Uh, Here it is. Um, That was, uh, I thirst. Uh, Then he says, it is finished. A declaration that the mission Jesus came to fulfill was complete. And in the powerful, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, we had a reminder that Jesus had said he had the power to lay down his life. Nobody takes it from him. And this was proof that that was true. We're often fascinated by last words, but these are not Jesus's last words. These are Jesus's last words before he would show the world that he would have the last word when it came to death. He would have the last word when it came to sin and hell and the grave. These are not the final sayings of Jesus. These were the last phrases that Jesus uttered before proving that he had the final say when it came to eternal life. We're fascinated by final words, but what about first words? I mean, we all want to know what a baby's first words are, right? So we can put it in the scrapbook, tell stories about it later. Uh, In case you're wondering what my daughter Tara's first words were, uh, the first word that we could make out that she said was good, which was in reference to the food that she was eating. Uh, Considering the stuff that I would sneak her, I suppose I'm lucky that her first word wasn't donut. I say I'm lucky because you would have found out my last words after my wife would have killed me. But, all's well that ends well. It's Easter. It's the day we celebrate when Jesus rose from the grave. Do you know what Jesus' first words were after the resurrection? Now, you'd think that the first words after Jesus came back to life would be powerful. Uh, Maybe they demonstrate what Jesus cares about. Whatever he would say would communicate value to whoever he was speaking to? Well, let's find out. This passage is from John chapter 20, starting with verses 1 and 2. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. We can only imagine the turmoil that Mary Magdalene was going through. At the beginning of the week, she had witnessed Jesus triumphantly enter the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday with fanfare and excitement. People thought that Jesus would be king. But by the end of the week, Jesus' followers and fans must have thought something went horribly wrong. Jesus would be beaten and executed. His followers weren't permitted to give him a proper burial. And all during the weekend, Mary probably thought over and over about giving Jesus the simple honor of a proper burial. On this morning, Mary woke before there was no light in the sky. And maybe she had trouble sleeping. Just another sleepless night, just waiting until the Sabbath was over at sunrise so she could visit Jesus' tomb. When she arrived at the tomb, however, she saw that the stone had been rolled away and there was no body inside. So she went to get Peter and John. It says, she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures, that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. 
Now, is this confusing to Mary Magdalene? Did she have a different perspective than Peter and John? Did they understand and she didn't? Or did only John get get what was happening at first? Did Mary not believe that Jesus was really resurrected? Uh, The way that this story is laid out in John chapter 20 is a little bit confusing, and it does leave the readers with some questions as to what exactly happened. But it appears that Peter and John examine the tomb and then go home and leave Mary there. And that was it. Uh, Mary was exhausted physically and mentally. She was grieving. She had not been able to say a proper goodbye to Jesus. And now she thought his, his body had been stolen. And the people that she expected to understand and empathize and sympathize with her have looked around and gone home. And it's at this point that Mary breaks down and cries. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. Now the word used to describe crying in verse 12 is not a little cry. This was wailing. Mary was beyond distraught, inconsolable. She probably didn't recognize that she was speaking to angels. She might not have been able to see through her tears or or maybe closed eyes and clenched fists. And that's when Jesus shows up. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. People have theorized and speculated over this for years. Was it still too dark? Is that why Mary didn't recognize Jesus? Was she so overcome with grief that she didn't even realize who she was talking to? Were her eyes clouded by tears? We don't know. But we do know that she saw Jesus behind her and then turned her attention right back to the tomb convinced that someone had stolen Jesus' body. And I wonder what Jesus was like in that moment. Did he have a sweet smile on his face? Was he concerned for his friend? He saw this person who he loved and who had followed him faithfully. And in this moment, she seems hopeless. Maybe he was smiling, knowing that just in a matter of seconds, just by speaking a few words to her, Mary's world would completely change. Hope would be restored. Not temporary hope, but eternal hope. Here it comes. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? And Mary Magdalene thinks... He's the gardener. (laughs) She thought he was the gardener. That's what scripture says. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. You know why she thought Jesus was the gardener? Because she didn't expect to see him there. In that moment, she might not have ever expected to see him again. She might never have expected to have hope again. But that's all about to change. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Teacher, don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary runs to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The woman who had been weeping and wailing moments before, who had absolutely no hope, was now bringing the message of hope to everyone else.
A resurrected Jesus changes everything. And I want you to know that there is good reason to believe. You can go on our YouTube channel uh, or the past messages section of our website and check out our series that's called Refinding My Faith. And I hope you'll give that a watch if you haven't already. And I hope that that will encourage you and give you ample reason to believe that Jesus really is the Son of God, that he really did rise from the grave, giving hope not just to Mary Magdalene, but also to the world. As I said, a resurrected Jesus changes everything. A resurrected Jesus means that even when life seems to be at its worst, God is still working. A resurrected Jesus means that everything that Jesus said about living a life uh, worth living here, abundant life, and a life also with a mind toward eternity, is true. And a resurrected Jesus means that when all seems hopeless, there is still hope. I guarantee you that what Mary Magdalene thought was maybe the best possible scenario when she got to the tomb that day was not what she got. She thought she might clean a tomb, prepare a body. I won't go into gory detail, but it wouldn't have been pleasant. But because of the power of Jesus, she got so much more and so much better than she could have ever hoped for. And I believe that that's still true of Jesus to this day. With Jesus, we get more than we could have ever hoped for. And in those first words that Jesus said, he called Mary's name to recognize him and to bring her hope. I want you to have hope this morning. I want you to have peace and purpose in this life and the promise of eternity with Jesus in the next life. Easter is the story of why you can have it and how Jesus accomplished it. Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I hope that like Mary did on that day so long ago, I hope that you can hear Jesus calling your name right now, calling you to put your hope and faith and trust in him. If you would like to accept Jesus as your savior right now and accept the gift of eternal life and abundant life, would you just please pray this prayer right after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong things. Please forgive me of my sins. Right now, I ask you to be my personal savior. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to turn from my sins and follow you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I thank you for rising again three days later and taking those sins away. Thank you for saving me. And thank you for preparing a place for me up in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer right now, I got a question for you. What will your first words as a follower of Christ be? I would imagine that they're words that are infused with hope. Follow Jesus. He is the hope of the world. And I pray that as you follow him, you would share the hope that you have with others. Um, if you have any questions about uh, kind of what's the next step, uh, how to get involved at a church, at our church, we would love to have you involved at Seacoast Church. Um, please do me a favor, give me an email. Uh, my email is josh at seacoastredondo. Dot com. Uh, I, uh, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. I love to hear from you. Sometimes it takes a little bit to get back to you, but I will get back to you. Uh, I always try and get back to everybody. Um, and uh, I'd love to be an encouragement to you and see how we could help you out. Um, you know, for nothing else, you can email me 
how many Easter eggs you saw in the background of this message. Uh, speaking of this message, uh, a special thank you goes out to Andrew Larson and Tim Miller, uh, who gave me the inspiration uh, for this message today. And uh, I owe a lot to them and I've Joshified some stuff. So thank you, uh, Andrew and Tim. Happy Easter, everyone. God bless you all.